if you will, to that passage of scripture that we read just a few months ago, over in Genesis chapter 49. As we mentioned, we didn't uh, make it through last week all that we were supposed to cover, and so we're going to try to do that today. We'll be moving along quickly. There is an immense amount of material here in Genesis chapter 14, in the, excuse me, 49, in these uh, prophecies that Jacob gives concerning his sons and concerning their history as uh, the nation of Israel will come into being. And so uh, take your Bibles and turn there with me, if you will, to uh, Genesis chapter 49. Last time, you remember, we looked at the initial uh, part of the prophecy concerning Joseph, and as we noted, uh, it is one of the longest portions of this prophecy that Jacob makes concerning his sons. The other long portion is, of course, related to Judah, the one from whom our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would come, the one who the scripture descri describes as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And in that first half, in verses 22 through 24, we saw that Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him, but his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. We saw that Joseph, the eleventh son of Jacob, the first son of Rachel, was the one who was the beloved son of his old age. He was beloved by his father for at least four reasons, the son of a favorite wife, the son of old age, the son with righteous character, and because of the prophetic foreordination of God, as we saw in Joseph's dreams concerning his brothers and concerning his parents. We saw the contrast, you recall, between Joseph and the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. It's not merely a contrast between Joseph and his other brothers, but the specific sons of Bilhah and Zilpah are stated in Genesis 37, where he brings the bad report against them, and we see the contrast with Joseph's righteous character when we looked at the 
a pericope concerning uh, Potiphar's wife in Egypt. Joseph was a man who remained in fellowship and refused evil, whereas his brothers did not. So the brothers hated him for at least two reasons. We saw those. Number one, the evil report that he brought, because of, dark, of course, darkness hates light. And secondly, because of Jacob's visible preference for Joseph, Jacob had given to Joseph the coat of many colors. And we had noted at that time that sometimes we tend to fault Jacob for doing that, but perhaps that was a wrong kind of a criticism because what we see here is a picture of God the Father who in the eternal decrees specifically chose, elected, and predestinated some for salvation and blessing and others he predetermined for damnation and passed them by. In the choices that Jacob makes, God gives us an illustration that he as God has the right to make elective choices that he as God has the right to grant distinct and separate blessings according to his own will, as Jacob does with Joseph and the coat of many colors. And thirdly, he as God has the right to determine prophetic futures even before the birth of the children. And you recall we looked at the uh, classical passage in Romans chapter 9 verses 10 through 16 where it's very clear that God chose Jacob rather than Esau even before the children were born. And Paul concludes that passage with, So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. God has the right to choose, and we as people have no right to complain about the choices that he makes. We also saw that uh, Jacob loved Joseph because Joseph was a man of faith. And we saw this particularly in relation to Joseph's bones. He takes an oath of the children of Israel that they will take his bones when they leave Egypt. And that happens 400 years later. Genesis 50:25 makes that point. Exodus 13:19 tells us that Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Joshua chapter 24, 32 tells us that the bones of Joseph with the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried in Shechem, in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. And then we find that Hebrews 11.22 tells us that this is one of the reasons that uh, Joseph is included in the line of faith. It was an act of faith. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel, and that was a prophetic mention because that happened 400 years later, and gave commandment concerning his bones. So a rather important portion of scripture that we've looked at that backs up the passage that we're looking at today. We saw the first half of the prophecy dealt with Joseph as a fruitful bough, and of course his sons Ephraim and Manasseh, who have already received a special prophetic blessing from Jacob uh, in the verses prior to this, uh, they were ultimately the largest of the tribes. And we saw how that also tied us into John chapter 14 and 15 and 16, where in chapter 15 Jesus speaks about himself as the vine and we are the branches and we are to bear fruit, much fruit, more fruit, and much fruit in that passage. We saw it was by a well that Joseph would be. And water speaks of the source of the fruitfulness and as we look at the New Testament, also the spiritual connection that we have to Christ through the Holy Spirit. And we saw that in John 4 where we find the woman at the well, then cometh he to a city of Samaria which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. So it takes us back to this prophecy that was 1800 years prior to the time that we see uh, it being fulfilled uh, there at the woman of the well in Samaria and the many people who came out of Samaria and trusted in Christ. It says Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey sat thus on the well and it was about the sixth hour and of course the woman comes and you know the story of how she trusts him and goes and calls the other men of the city and they come and trust him as well. And then it said whose branches run over the wall the fruit being clearly available to those outside the wall of Israel and that is to us a promise of blessing uh, and the Apostle Paul talks about how Christ has broken down the middle wall of partition between us in Ephesians 2 and then the archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him of course we looked at the passages that showed that this was the brothers uh, that were shooting at him as a, at a distance they were trying to eradicate Joseph but uh, when we see that passage quoted in Deborah's song in Judges chapter 5, it says, They that are delivered from the noise of the archer in the places of drawing of water. It takes us right back to that prophecy in Genesis chapter 50. And that is the first place we find the phrase, Lead thy captivity captive 
and we see that is picked up in the Psalms and then it is picked up in Ephesians as being fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, his bow abode in strength. The arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. The brothers were not able to defeat Joseph because God is sovereign, because God is the one who is in control, and as we saw last week from the cross-references, our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who personally protected and guarded Joseph. And we see that from those final phrases, from thence, that is, from the mighty God of Jacob, is the shepherd and stone of Israel. And we track the incredible prophecies all the way through the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament where they are fulfilled in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the good shepherd. He tells us that twice in John chapter 10. Uh, he is the one who is the great shepherd of the sheep in Hebrews chapter 13. He is the one who is the shepherd and bishop of your souls in 1 Peter 2.25. He is the one who is the chief shepherd in 1 Peter 5, 4. He is also the one who is the stone, and he, for Israel he was a stone of stumbling because they did not trust in him. Isaiah 8, 14 says, A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense both to the houses of Israel for a jinn and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And Peter picks that up in 1 Peter 2, 8 and says that Christ is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, quoting Isaiah 8, 14. A son of stumbling a rock of offense even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient. And here again we have double predestination whereunto also they were appointed. God is sovereign. And that was one of the things that came across very loud and clear in these prophecies concerning Joseph that we looked at last week. But for us who are believers, he is a living stone, 1 Peter 2.4. He is laying in Zion as a chief cornerstone, 1 Peter 2.6. He is the stone which the builders disallowed, the same who was made the head of the corner. And this is the one that, quoting that passage in Acts chapter 4, says, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. And in Ephesians 2.20, the one who is the chief cornerstone. So incredible number of passages that tie this prophecy concerning Joseph with fulfillment as we see in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. But now as we look at the second section which we read this morning, uh, we see that God gives Joseph through the prophecy of Jacob seven specific promised blessings based on the covenant to Abraham, the covenant to Isaac, and the covenant to Jacob. It's going to, as Jacob speaks, he's going to talk about your progenitors. A progenitor is an ancestor, one who is a, a direct ancestor in your physical line. And so he's going to be speaking of some progenitors, and that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he has something very exciting to say to Joseph about that particular prophecy. So we see the covenants that are given to Joseph and his descendants, and they come not simply because it is Jacob who's speaking it, but he says, the God of thy father, the one who is the Almighty. This is the God who overrules all of history. He's the one who gave special promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and to the 12 tribes, and he is almighty. He is capable of fulfilling his promises, and no man can stay his hand, as the book of Daniel says, and Nebuchadnezzar admits, no man can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? God is sovereign, Daniel 4.35. And so what are the seven blessings? The first we see is the blessing where he will bless thee with the blessings of heaven above. We're going to talk about these in more detail, but I'll list them for you first. The blessings of heaven above, that is, spiritual blessings, unseen blessings. God's ever watchful eye and ever present person is there, though we may not see him. And Joseph, you are going to have the blessings of heaven. The second is, he will bless you with the blessings of the deep that lieth under. Those are temporal blessings from the hidden depths of the earth and the sea. Those things that are under your feet, it doesn't matter where you go, whatever is under you, God is going to bless you out of the earth itself. The third is blessings of the breast. We see here the sustenance of a mother with her child. A nursing baby, God will take care of you the same way a mother defends and protects and sustains her child. She always cares for it, even in its helpless condition. Then the next promise is the blessing of the room, womb. There's fruitfulness with many descendants, and he's going to build on that a little bit later in the prophecy. The blessings of the womb, the fruitfulness that God gives with many descendants for those who love him and who obey him. Then we see the blessing number five, greater than the blessings of his ancestors passed to their sons. I think this is perhaps the most significant of the blessings that we have here. It's the fifth 
blessing. That is the number of grace. Here is going to be something poured out above and beyond anything that was blessed to Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. It's going to surpass the blessings of your progenitors. Now you stop and think about that for a second. Those are some incredible blessings that Jacob is passing on to Joseph here. He's not just waxing eloquent. He's not just making this up. He's not just batting his teeth together. He is giving prophetic utterance concerning Joseph. And we'll talk about those in just a second. And number six, blessings that last beyond the time of the everlasting hills. That is, blessings that will not pass away until the earth itself passes away. That's a pretty long time blessing. This is what Jacob is blessing Joseph with. We never see any other kinds of blessings like this from father to son as we go back through the line of the patriarchs being given to any particular son. It's, a, it's an amazing set of blessings that is being given to Joseph here. And then finally, blessing on Joseph's head because of his suffering, suffering and separation from his uh, brethren. You know, this is rather interesting. Of the seven blessings that are mentioned, this is the only blessing for which a reason is given. God gives these other blessings without any reason. But the seventh blessing is a blessing that comes because Joseph has been separated from his brethren. You know, that's a, a significant thing that I think we want to look at in a little bit. Now, the first blessing is he will help Joseph. That's practical assistance in time of need. You know, as we look at Scripture, we find that there is a desperate need for a helper. We find in... 2 Kings 14.26, it says, The Lord saw the affliction of Israel, but it was very bitter, for there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. That is our need. You know, we get in difficult circumstances, don't we? Sometimes it's a physical condition, it's, it's illness, it's disease, it's perhaps an accident. Uh, we heard this last Wednesday evening that... Um, Ron Vandermeer's sister, who's married to Dr. Gary Cohen, was in a, a head-on automobile collision and uh, went through brain surgery and suffering tremendous physical problems of that. Sometimes we get into really difficult physical situations. There's some in this congregation that have heart problems, some that have cancer, some that have other physical conditions that are debilitating to them. We have desperate conditions. And the Lord saw that there was any helper, no helper for Israel. Then we find the petition for a helper in verse uh, 26. It says, the Lord, uh, excuse me, we find that the only helper that is available is the Lord himself. Behold, God is mine helper. The Lord is with them that uphold my soul. Psalm 72, 12, for he shall deliver the needy when he crieth the poor also, and him that hath no helper. And we discover that this particular promise to be a helper is also available for us today. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. I love the book of Hebrews. has so many incredible promises that are for us who trust in Christ. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Oh, how we live in a world of covetousness, don't we? We live in a society where we think that what's going to really be our helper is if we just get a little more junk. <laughs> you know, every now and then I have to take assessment of what we've got, and I think we sure have a lot of junk. We have so much stuff that we don't need, so much stuff that we don't use. We've got to get rid of some of this stuff. But, you know, when we got it, the first time we got it, it's because we thought it was going to assist us. We thought it was going to help us. We thought it was going to be good for us. But this world is not our helper, and the stuff of this world is not our helper. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Covetousness is idolatry. Ephesians 5.5 5 and Colossians 3.5. It tells us that covetousness is idolatry and the covetous man is an idolater. Very serious charge. Let your conversation be without covetous and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. By the way, that's the definition of what a helper is from God's perspective. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. <laughs> the definition of the helper, the Lord is my helper, is given there when it says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And the result of those who believe that promise is given in the last phrase, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. The Lord is my helper. That promise is available for us. Then the next three promises dealing with heaven above, the deep that lieth under, and the 
blessings of the breath. Uh, it's rather interesting as you go through, and we won't have time to cover the entire two chapters, because there are two full chapters in the book of Deuteronomy that deal with those particular promises and the converse, the, uh, <coughs> the curses that come on those who do not trust in God, those who do not walk by faith, those who have chosen to go their own way in the way of the world. Uh, you know that Deuteronomy chapter 27 and Deuteronomy chapter 28 are the cursings and the blessings from Mount Ebal and from Mount Gerizim. When the children of Israel crossed over into the promised land, uh, half of the tribes stood on Mount Ebal, half of the tribes stood on Mount Gerizim. And the tribes that were on Mount Ebal, God told them to make there a pile of stones and plaster them over and inscribe the words of the law on those stones and no uh, metal instrument was to be used up to square away the stones. They were to be the rough hewn stones because this was the way God made those stones and they were to put them there and then they were to stand on that mountain and they were to pronounce a certain series of curses. And those who were over on Mount Gerizim were to stand and face and pronounce a certain number of blessings that God would give to them to pronounce. It was a very dramatic and very well easily remembered event in the history of Israel. And two whole chapters in the book of Deuteronomy are given to those curses and blessings. And we discover as we go through those cursings and blessings that they cover many of the things that are here listed for us in this prophecy concerning the tribe of Joseph. Rather interesting, as you look at them also, when you find the division of the tribes, the tribes that stood to pronounce the blessing over on Mount Gerizim were Simeon and Levi, and Judah and Issachar, and Joseph and Benjamin. Rather interesting because, of course, we've just seen a series of blessings for Joseph's sons, for Ephraim and Manasseh. But when we get to the curses and the blessings, it's called the tribe of Joseph. And so we find these two brothers, Joseph and Benjamin, their descendants are the ones who stand to pronounce the blessings from Mount Gerizim. It's Joseph rather than Ephraim and Manasseh. And um, I'll read you just a little bit of that portion of the text it says and Moses with the elders of Israel commanded the people saying keep all the commandments which I command you this day and it shall be on the day when ye shall pass over Jordan into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee that thou shalt set up great stones and plaster them with plaster and thou shalt write upon them all the words of this law when thou art passed over that thou mayest go into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee a land that floweth with milk and honey as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee so here it is, the conditions, if you want to dwell in the land which has been promised and which Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then the twelve tribes received that promise, here's what you have to do. Therefore it shall be when you are gone over Jordan that you shall set up these stones which I command you this day in Mount Ebal, and thou shalt plaster them with plaster. Interesting, Mount Ebal was the place from which the curses were pronounced. They didn't set them up in Mount Ephraim, they set them out in Mount Ebal. Because you see, the law only condemns. The law cannot save you. If you are trusting obedience to the law to get you to heaven, you are lost. It's by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The law only brings judgment. The law only brings condemnation. No man in the flesh can keep the law, but our Lord Jesus Christ kept it per perfectly. And so those who place their faith in him receive his gift of eternal life. And so it says, And you shall build an altar unto the Lord thy God, an altar of stones. Thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon them. Thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones. Thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon to the Lord thy God. And thou shalt offer peace offerings and eat there and rejoice before the Lord thy God. And in verse 8, And thou shalt write upon the stones all the words of this law very plainly. And as you read through, you discover that those were the curses that are commanded. Now, we will skip down to, uh, it, it lists a bunch of things, and most of those lie within the uh, scope of the Ten Commandments and the rest of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 27. But as we get to the blessings, in chapter 28, starting in verse 2, it says, And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. It's almost like you can't get away from the blessings. It says those blessings will overtake you. Now, you might want to get away from something bad. You might want to get away from the curses. You might want to run away if a lion was chasing you. But if somebody was running down the road with a bag full of a million dollars chasing you, how hard would you run to get away? You wouldn't. You would want them to catch you. 
Well, even if you try to escape the blessing, says God, when you follow my ways, when you do my will and obey my word, the blessings will overtake you. That's the grace of God. Even when we don't quite get it, God is going to overtake us with his blessings. As long as we obey what he tells us to do, we may not understand it, we may be feeble in our faith, but remember, only a grain of mustard seed faith will move mountains. It's just a matter of trust God, and you know what? The blessings, he says, will overtake you. And as you look at those blessings, starting in verse 3 and 4 now, it says, Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body. The scripture sees children as a blessing from God. We're going to look at that in just a moment. But here in the blessings and cursings, we find that God specifically, right at the head of the list, says, Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body. We've talked about Joseph having the blessings of the breast and the blessings of the womb. How God takes care of Joseph like a, a little tiny baby being cared for by its mother. And then the multiplicity and the growth and the expansion of his tribe. And indeed God did that for him. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of the ground and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies to rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way. They shall flee before thee seven ways. It goes on and gives many, many more blessings and it talks about God, the Israel being the holy people of God. Then we get back to verse 11. It says, And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods in the fruit of thy body and in the fruit of thy cattle, the fruit of thy ground, and the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. You know, it's, it's that emphasis that you are going to be blessed, as we would say in modern English, blessed out of your socks. Because God is the one who promises it. And so we see a parallel between the blessings that are promised to Joseph and the blessings that God gives to Israel if they will obey him. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. Wouldn't that be a lesson for us here in the United States? What is our national debt now? It is such an incredibly gigantic amount that if all of us were to pay our entire incomes, we wouldn't be able to cover everything for every man, woman, and child alive in the United States. That's bizarre. And as a result, we see God's curse upon our nation. Some serious things. Deuteronomy 28.13 When we obey him, it says, The Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above and thou shalt not be beneath. If that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. We see some principles here that apply not merely to national Israel, but also which apply to any nation that wants God's blessing. Any nation that wants to be at the top and not at the bottom. Any nation that wants to be the head and not the tail. And when we have walked away from God as our nation has done, we suddenly find that there is a reversal in our, quote, fortunes. It's not fortune. It is the direct hand of God of blessing or of chastening. When our nation served him and not only recognized him, but worshipped him as the one true God of heaven, we received his blessings. We are now in a state whereby our nation is coming under his hand of judgment and cursing. We see it really trembling just a little bit as we see the earthquake that took place down in Virginia this past week and then this hurricane which God in his mercy has thus far spared us but it shows that all he need do is blow or shake the earth he is a sovereign God and he can cause all nations to crumble before him that was indeed emphasized as we saw some time ago Deuteronomy 28:18. What happens to those who disobey him? Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body. We see the destruction of our unborn in this country. Millions of babies being aborted. We see right now more than 50% of all children that are born in the United States are born out of wedlock. What kind of a nation is that? And that's even with all the ones who are being killed through abortion. 
50% of those who are being born are born out of wedlock, more than 50%. Dear folks, our nation is in trouble. Our nation is coming under the judgment of God. Down a little bit further, down to verse 23. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass. The earth that is under thy feet shall be iron. Remember, God had made a promise to Joseph about the blessings from beneath and the blessings from heaven. But when we disobey God's ways, we neither get the blessings from heaven or from the earth itself. Jumping down to chapter 28, verse 32. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thy hand. The fruit of thy land, thy labor, shall a, neighbor, a nation which thou knowest not eat up. Thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed always. You'll be mad in the sight of your eyes for what you see. It goes on and talks about all these horrible diseases that are going to hit them simply because they would not obey God. You know our nation is filled with all kinds of unique and strange and weird diseases that are coming on all kinds of people because of the wickedness of our nation and its moral indigency. Getting down to verse 41. Here we have more of the curses for those who refuse God's word. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. Verse 46 and 47, They shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever, because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. We are a nation who has forgotten to be thankful. It's a nation that Paul describes in Romans chapter 1. When they knew God, they glorified him, not his God. Neither were they thankful. In just a couple of months, we're coming to November. We come to Thanksgiving. And you will discover that all around our country, people are celebrating Turkey Day. Or they're being told that they should thank their neighbors for all their neighbors have done for them during this past year. But there will be a distinct press by those in the media, and perhaps even from governmental officials, to avoid any recognition that it is the sovereign God of the universe to whom we must be thankful for all the blessings that he has given to our country. Here we find one of the reasons that that curse comes. And as Moses explains it to us here, because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and gladness for the abundance of all things. That's thanksgiving. Skipping over many more verses where these judgments come, it gets to one that is really grotesque, but it has happened in the history of Israel. It has happened in other nations of the world. It may happen someday here in the United States. Verses 53 and following. Thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee in the siege and in the straightness, wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee. So that the man that is tender among you, that is the really wimpy guy, and very delicate, the one who really would never lift a finger to do anything. His eyes shall be evil toward his brother and toward the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children which he shall leave, so that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall eat, because he hath nothing left him in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in all thy gates. The tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eyes shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom and toward her son and toward her daughter and toward her young one that shall come out from between her feet and toward her children which she shall bear, for she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gates. You know, that happened in the days of Elisha. That happened in Second Kings chapter 6. It says, There was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it, until an ass's head was sold for four pieces of silver, and the fourth part of a cab of dung, dove's dung for five pieces of silver. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the lord do not help thee from whence shall I help thee, out of the barn floor or out of the winepress? And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him, and she hath hid her son. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman, that he rent his clothes and passed by on the wall, and people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth upon his flesh. 
Then he said, God do so and more unto me also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. But Elisha sat in his house and the elders with him. And the king sent a man from before him. But ere the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, See how this son of a murderer has sent to take away mine head? Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door and hold him fast. It is not the sound of his master's feet behind him. And while he talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him and said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? God let it get that bad. God let it get that bad because the people had turned away from him. And of course you know the rest of it. Elisha makes the prophecy saying that tomorrow at that time that there would be a measure of fine flour sold for a shekel, two measures of barley for a shekel in the gates of Samaria. And God sends this noise that scares away the host that's outside of Syria. They run away. They leave stuff all along the way. There are four lepers that are sitting in the gate of the city. They begin to talk to each other and they say, you know, if we go into the city, we'll starve. But, you know, if we go out to the host of the Syrians, you know, if they kill us, that's no big deal because we're going to starve anyway. So why don't we go out there and see if they'll show us mercy. And they come to the camp of the Syrians and it's empty. And there's all this food and they're running from one tent to another and they're gobbling up everything that they can and picking up silver and gold and having a great time. And suddenly one of them says, hey, you know, what we're doing is not very good. We're going to have something evil happen to us if we don't go back and tell the city because the city is starving. These men who the city would not let them come inside because they were lepers, these men show mercy to that city. And Ahab and his servant ride out on the best horses they got and sure enough they find the Syrians have fled and so the people come out, spoil it and the next day the prophecy is fulfilled. But you see there had been a man who said God himself couldn't open the windows of heaven and make that kind of a blessing and Elisha says to him, you know, tomorrow you're going to see it but you're not going to eat of it. And that next day as the people ran out and were so eager to pick stuff up they trampled him underfoot and he died. Dear people, God is in control. And God means business when it comes to sin. And God means business when it comes to judging nations that turn their backs on Him. But we see the promises and the blessings to Joseph. But we see that God also has also given some curses for those who will not obey Him, for those who will not do His will, for those who have decided to go their own way. And so it will be with our nation. Back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Jumping down to verse 63, And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and you shall be plucked off from the land whither thou goest to possess it. Oh, so many other things. I encourage you to read Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28 and seriously consider if God is not bringing these things to pass upon our nation because we have turned our backs on the living God. The next thing he says, the blessings of the womb. You know, children are always seen as a blessing and a heritage from God, not a curse or something to be avoided. As you track the word heritage through the Old Testament in particular, you discover that God gives a number of heritages to his children. And we all want all the other ones, but we seem to want to reject the one that deals with children. For example, the land of Israel was called a heritage that God gave to the children of Israel. Exodus chapter 6, verse 8. I will bring you into the land concerning the which I swore to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. We find David refers to the land, the land of Israel, as that heritage. The lions are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. Psalm 135, 12. And gave their land for an heritage, an heritage unto Israel his people. Psalm 136, verses 21 and 22. He gave their land for an heritage, for his mercy endureth forever. Even an heritage to Israel his servant, for his mercy endureth forever. Yeah, we like that promise. That's a great promise. But he also gives another promise. Divine protection is the heritage of those who trust in the Lord. Isaiah 54, 17, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment shalt thou condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And the righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Isaiah 58, 14, Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. We find that not only is divine protection given, spoken of as a heritage, but spiritual blessings and God's word are given to us as a heritage. Psalm 61, 5, For thou, O God, hast heard my voice, vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. 
Psalm 119.11, Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. Now, we all like those things. There's the land. There's protection. There's spiritual blessing. There's God's word. All are spoken of as a heritage. But children are also an heritage of the Lord. So why do we reject this portion of the inheritance? Well, there are so many young people today in Christian churches that are rejecting this portion of God's heritage. So many are turning their backs on it because they want to have more fun. They want to have more time. They want to have more quality time with each other. Dear people, those are all secular, worldly ways of looking at what God says is one of the greatest of all of his heritages. Psalm 127, 3 through 5, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb, we're speaking here of the promise that God gives to Joseph, the promise of the womb. The fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. I don't know any man who would want to go into battle with his quiver having only two or 1.5 arrows in it. I mean, that .5 arrow wouldn't do any good, but that's, you know, we're, we're averaging today between 1.5 and 1.8 children for most Christian families in the United States. That's the balance that the government and educational system and the philosophers of our day and the psychiatrists and all the worldlings are saying, really, you shouldn't have much more than that. Just enough to reproduce yourselves because, after all, we've got an overcrowded planet. Those are all lies from Satan. Children are in heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. If you were going into battle, you'd want as many as you could. They shall not be ashamed. They shall speak with the en enemies in the gate. The progenitors, oh, that's a really exciting word. We're going to get to that in just a second. But that's an ancestor in a direct line, as we mentioned. And then the everlasting hills. You're going to last longer than the everlasting hills. Multiple prophecies, by the way, uh, deal with uh, Joseph and with the promises to national Israel that say it's going to last with the blessings of God as long as this earth exists. For example, Jeremiah 31, 35, Thus saith the Lord, here he's speaking to Israel, speaking to those who are physical Jews, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinance of the moon by the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waters thereof roar. This is a pretty big God that we're talking about here. The Lord of hosts is his name. So this is God, Jehovah himself, making this promise. He wants you to know he's the one who created everything. He's the one who sustains everything. He is the one who is known as the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. If those ordinances, that is the sun and the moon, and all these things that God has made, depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth stretched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. That's a pretty heavy promise. You know, uh, I have a friend who is a, uh, a Jewish Christian. He was converted as a child, and uh, when he got baptized, his parents uh, held a burial ceremony for him, buried in an empty casket, and his father never spoke to him after that day until that father died, never came to Christ. Uh, but he has become a... Uh, a Christian minister and now proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ boldly with a special interest in Israel because of course he is Jewish and he has a message that he frequently brings on college campuses uh, which is entitled how to destroy Israel and uh, I think I've mentioned this to you before but uh, at those lectures always there are lots of uh, Arab and Muslim uh, students that show up uh, to hear how to destroy Israel and he takes them to this passage here he says, well, what you need to do is make some rockets to go out and blow up all the stars and the sun and the moon, because if you can do that, then you can get rid of Israel, because God has said, and here's his promise. And, of course, he doesn't make lots of friends uh, that way, but he does point out what the Word of God says concerning the promises that God has made to Israel. And then he says, and God's going to bring blessings upon his head. And we read that in Deuteronomy 28:13: The Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above and not beneath. But the opposite is true, that if you do not obey, he will make you the one who is the borrower 
and not the lender. Now we move on down to the prophecy concerning Benjamin, verse 27, the youngest son of Jacob, the second son of Rachel, who was Jacob's favorite wife, as you know. He was also deeply loved by Joseph, as we saw in that narrative concerning uh, the sons who came to Egypt for food, and when uh, he saw Benjamin, it says his, his bowels yearned for Benjamin. I mean, it just, because this was his real full brother. This is the last son of his mother Rachel before she died. She died giving childbirth to Benjamin. Oh, how he loved Benjamin. And when Benjamin's mess was set, it was five times bigger. That is, his dinner was set uh, when all the brothers were eating there with Joseph. It was five times as much as all the other brothers got. Joseph loved his brother Benjamin. But it's interesting, the prophecy says, Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. Now the word raven can be used as a verb or as a noun. Uh, raven means to tear in pieces, and when it's used as a noun, it's used once that way. I believe it's over in the book of Hosea. Uh, it, the, the wolf ravens or the lion has pieces of raven that it takes to its den for its young. Uh, it's the ripped up portion of the carcass. It says, Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. This is going to be a tribe that has a fierce and warlike character. And we discover that Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin, the first king of Israel. The tribe of Benjamin had the privilege of giving Israel its first king. We find that Benjamin had ten sons, Bela and Becher and Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Eli, Rosh, Mupim, Hupim, and Ard. Now, you think I have weird names for my kids. Just look at that list there. Um, aren't you glad that, and I think my kids are glad too, that I didn't give them all those names. But when we look at the Benjamin, we track Benjamin through the history of Israel. We discover that during the wilderness wandering, this tribe was on the west side with the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. Of course, those are the sons of Joseph, Benjamin's full brother. So as we have been looking at the different tribes and the way God divided them around the tabernacle in the wilderness wanderings, there were three tribes on each side. And we find all the tribes that related to the sons of Rachel are over on the west side. We find that the land that was granted in the conquest was just south of Ephraim, who was, of course, a brother tribe, and just north of Judah. And that helps you understand, by the way, if you learn some of these little geographic and historic things, it helps you understand the text. It's sort of like when uh, my wife and I lived in Israel, and we had the opportunity to go and see some of the sites that were scattered around the land that we were reading about in our text. All of a sudden, the text made sense. All of a sudden, these geographical descriptions made sense. And you could picture in your mind the movement of troops. You could picture in your mind how David is escaping on one side of this hill uh, as Saul is going around the other side of the hill. You can picture the Valley of Sorek. You can picture uh, as um, Samson goes down, you know, down to the Philistines. You can picture the different wadis that run all the way down and there's a Philistine city, the five cities of the Philistines at the end of all these valleys that go up toward Jerusalem. I mean, it's a fantastic thing that you begin to learn and see. Well, here is some information that helps us to understand what is going on next in the tribe of Benjamin. You see, we see some very grotesque things occurring in Judges chapter 19 and 20. We find the whole land is out of fellowship, and it's as it says in the last part of the book of Judges, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. We find truly, here is a nation totally out of fellowship with God. And when we get to chapter 19 of the book of Judges, we discover that even the priestly tribe, the Levitical tribe, is out of fellowship with God. We have a Levite from Ephraim, you remember the Levites were scattered around the 12 different tribes and they were supposed to be teaching God's word to those tribes. And they were also, uh, it's a long, very interesting study, but they were also sort of the first line of defense. If you look where the Levitical cities are located around the nation of Israel, they were the standing military force. They were warrior priests and they were to defend the borders of Israel. Now here we find a man who is a Levite. He is a man who's a warrior priest. He's a man who's supposed to be teaching the truth of God and all those blessings and cursings that we saw in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28 to the children of Israel. What has he done? He's taken a concubine out of Judah. So you can picture this in your mind because here's Ephraim and then here we find Benjamin and then we find Judah and we find this man 
has his concubine, he's got her from Judah, he's taken her back up to Ephraim, and then she runs away and goes back to her dad. He follows herself, gets there, makes peace, and the dad is really nice to him and has him stay around for a few days and they eat a lot. And then finally he says, look, i got to get back home. And so they're going back home. He's got his concubine with him. He's got his servant with him. The servant says, hey, let's turn in here to Jebus, which is uh, where the Jebusites live, the ancient name for the city of Jerusalem. He says, no, those are a bunch of strangers. We'll not go there. Let's turn over here to Gibeah of Benjamin. Gibeah of Benjamin is a very important city in Benjamin's territory. He's on his way back north up to Mount Ephraim. And as they turn aside, they can't get housing any place, so they're going to sleep in the street. This old man comes in from the field. And he says, well, why don't you stay with me? The guy says, well, no, probably not. And he says, no, 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 he insists, so they stay with him. And that evening, sodomites surround the house. And they want the man who has just, the wayfarer, who has just been heading back north. They don't want his concubine. They don't, the man offers his daughter, he offers his concubine. They say, no, we want him. He shoves the concubine outside. They abuse her all night. And the next morning when he opens the door, she's dead on the steps. He cuts her in pieces and sends these pieces to each of the tribes of Israel. Says, hey guys, what do you think we ought to do about this? Now this is bizarre, but this is the way they did it. And this is what happened. This shows you what happens when God's people are out of fellowship. And so all the, the tribes, the rest of the tribes get together and say, we're going to punish them. They say, give us the men who were doing this stuff there at Gibeah. The Benjamites say, we're not going to do it. We'll go to war with you instead. They're a very warlike tribe. And so there's a huge massacre that takes place, and only 600 men of the tribe of Benjamin are left alive. And they run up and sit on the top of a rock, where it'll be hard, really hard to get them. But then everybody else feels sorry for them because they say, well, we've just wiped them out. We've killed all their wives. We've killed all their kids. These are the only guys left in the tribe of Benjamin. And so they work out this little arrangement whereby they can kidnap some wives uh, at Jabesh Gilead and at Shiloh when they go out to dance. Horrendous story. Horrendous story. That's the tribe of Benjamin. You see how far someone can fall from blessings that God has given. There's a tribe that, although it produced the first king and stayed with Saul's son Ishbosheth after Saul's death for a very long time, but they were a tribe that later supported David. We find Ehud, the judge, was from Benjamin. Very interesting. Uh, it mentions the one of the physical genetic traits of that tribe when it talks about Ehud. You remember Ehud uh, was the man who stabbed Eglon to death. He was a big fat guy and Ehud was left-handed. So he was wearing his dagger over here on his right thigh. He reached in and they hadn't checked the right thigh. They checked the left thigh but reached in and stuck Ehud through and then climbed out the window uh, and escaped, called the army together and they defeated the Moabites. A fascinating passage in Judges chapter 3. A man of Benjamin. But that left-handedness was a tribe characteristic. It says in First Chronicles 12, 1 and 2, Now these are they that came to David to Ziklag, while he yet kept himself close because of Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men, helpers of the war. So here are men from Benjamin who have deserted Saul and have come over to David. And it says they were armed with bows and could use both the right hand and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows out of the bow, even of Saul's brethren of Benjamin. And of course you know that Saul, who became Paul in the New Testament, was also from the tribe of Benjamin, a man who made havoc of the church, the book of Acts tells us, tore it in pieces like a wolf before his conversion. Then the final verse in that section there, in verse 28, it says, All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is it that their fathers spake unto them and blessed them, everyone according to his blessing he blessed them. That final verse of Jacob's prophecy before his death and burial shows us that is then is very clearly related to Israel as a nation and to the physical descendants of the twelve tribes as listed. These are the twelve tribes of Israel. This is the blessing that their fathers spake unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing he blessed them. God still has promises for national Israel. We can see many parallels with the blessings that God gives to the church, with the chastening that God gives to the church. But God still has promises for national Israel. That's the reason we're premillennial and pre-tribulational. We recognize that God still has some judgment in store for Israel during the period of the Great Tribulation, and that God has some great blessings in store, even as he has promised, concerning the millennial reign 
of our Lord Jesus Christ on earth when Satan is bound for a thousand years and cast into the bottomless pit and uh, there's a perfect peace and righteousness on earth under the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking somewhat about that on Wednesday evenings as we've been going through a series on prophecy. We encourage you to join us at that time. Our time is up for today. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its promises. We thank you that your word is accurate. It is articulate. It is clear. It's not fuzzy. It's not foggy. It's not jumbled together. We find that you have made some very specific promises concerning Israel, concerning its 12 tribes. And Father, even as you have fulfilled prophecy always in the past, literally and specifically and precisely, even so you will those promises that you gave to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and to his 12 sons. Some that deal with blessing, some that deal with cursing, some that deal with uh, contingent promises based upon whether or not they would obey and others which are irreconcilably truly promises that you're going to give regardless. Father, we thank you for these great covenants that you have made because you are God. You are sovereign. You not only know the end from the beginning, but you determine the end from the beginning because it brings you the greatest amount of glory. And we praise you and thank you for that. Indeed, we praise you and thank you for you in your mercy have redeemed us by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.